Hello. I'm going to ask the first question. Um, Todd, can I ask you? I'm Sophie Rayworth. I actually work for BBC News. But in 2011, I collapsed. First marathon, 20 degrees at London. I um, had a temperature, which I can see now was my, whatever you call it, severe heat um, exertion of 41.2. And I was unconscious for about 20 minutes. I was completely novice. I didn't drink enough water. It was, it was quite warm that day. But I also took Nurofen, ibuprofen. People don't talk about that, but thousands of people will take it tomorrow. How much of a factor can that be in people collapsing? Um, thank you. Um, well, I'm sorry to hear you had that experience, firstly. Did, did you have any follow-up afterwards? Um, no. Okay. I finished. I had two hours and John Andrews, who were amazing. And I got up and walked and got to the bit, but it was a bit slower. Yeah, so I think... Uh, I think the simple answer is we don't know. I suspect you would have got unwell anyway. I, I, d I don't think a one-off dose of uh, a non-steroidal is going to necessarily cause you to have um, exertional heat stroke. Um, it, it can affect your, the, some of the processes involved in thermoregulation, and so it might have contributed, but I think on its own, probably not. Um, certainly, it would make the uh, severity of your illness um, worse, and it would potentially increase the likelihood of you developing those complications of uh, specifically a, a kidney injury afterwards. Um, for you, I, I would have wanted you to have serial blood tests. Um, I suspect they would have been abnormal, and I would have wanted to see that they were normalizing. Um, so you'd have probably needed a few days of blood tests. Um, if, if you were looked after by the team tomorrow, that, that would be our advice to you on discharge. And um, we would give you um, all the information you need to kind of follow that up. Uh, I, I wouldn't take ibuprofen before running a marathon. Uh, because I think it it, it significantly affects uh, your renal function, your kidney function. Um, and I think if you were to become unwell uh, during your marathon, albeit it's unlikely to happen, it will uh, increase the likelihood that you have more severe illness. Um, I think if you're taking ibuprofen to run a marathon, um, you probably shouldn't be running a marathon. Um, and I think if you... So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, paracetamol would be a safer alternative if you needed to take an analgesia. That doesn't have any effect on the kidneys. Um, but, uh, and I, I, I would absolutely uh, say that you shouldn't take ibuprofen uh, preemptively as a kind of, oh, I might, I might develop some aches and pains, so I'm going to take something um, preemptively. Sorry, can I just ask another question about um, exertional heat um, uh, stroke? Uh, just uh, you mentioned about calcium being drawn up into the muscles. Uh, is there, um, when you see these patients that are ill, do do they have um, abnormalities of their calcium metabolism afterwards? It's just I, I know of a case the last this last week. A friend's son has um, got Campylobacter in Manchester and uh, ended up was he was quite hypercalcemic. Um, low, low or high calcium, sorry? High. High, yeah, so he probably had rhabdomyolysis, um, I'd, I'd imagine. Um, so rhabdomyolysis is a syndrome where you get muscle breakdown, um, and then initially your calcium drops, and then it goes quite high, um, because there's a lot of calcium in muscle, um, and, and uh, yeah, it's just getting really, essentially the muscle... Um, in integrity of the muscle cells, you'll, you'll know this more than me, but um, the integrity of the muscle cells is, is damaged and so you get calcium leaking out of the muscle cells and it goes quite high. Um, typically, it, it doesn't cause a huge problem. Um, the main issue with rhabdomyolysis is the, is the kidney damage from the myoglobin. What is the panel's um, perspective on the, uh, whether there's a public health argument to move London Marathon to the autumn where the population is already heat acclimatized, could that reduce the incidence of exertional heat injury? Uh, shall, shall I, and I'll, I'll answer first and then I'm sure other people will have opinions. So I think I, I should have caveated my talk by saying marathons are good for you. Like the, this is a very, very rare complication of marathon running and I think the net benefit of, of marathon running far outweighs the fact that one or two people at every event will, will become unwell due to the marathon um, that they've run. Um, 
I don't think necessarily moving the event will be a significantly protective factor because you could easily have so that the you lose the although you can regain the heat uh, Lee will know more about this than me but it, although you can regain the heat acclimation benefits um, of, of of previous heat acclimation um, you still you could easily have a cold couple of weeks before uh, an autumn marathon and I, that wouldn't significantly influence um, the uh, the incidence of exertional heat stroke. And the other thing to say is actually the autumns are getting warmer and warmer. Um, and so I think it, you're probably statistically more likely to have a, a, a warm day in the autumn compared to, to the spring. And we saw with the Paris registry data and also our experience that if the temperature is above 20 degrees Celsius, you see a significantly higher rate incidence of exertional heat stroke. So I think I think uh, London, Manchester, Brighton are, are actually well positioned within the UK calendar. I would agree. <laughs> um, Todd, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question. I'm volunteering tomorrow at one of the medical stations, and it's to do with the acute follow-up. So say we deal with a patient who we are able to call in 15 minutes. And then discharging them from our tent, what would you advise as acute follow-up? Because you mentioned about innocuous cases going on to have detrimental impact later on. It's what's the best thing to do? So e even if you rapidly call someone, um, they might have had a, a, a high temperature and just not decompensated for a significant period of time. Um, and so I don't think you can rely on the, the time you've observed them to be hypothermic as, as predictive. I would say anybody who presents with CNS dysfunction, who you think who you have reason to believe has had a high temperature as well, um, should be referred to, to a service for serial blood tests. Ideally, they should have blood tests on on the day. Um, so go to their local A&E and get some blood tests, and then those should be followed up as appropriate. Um, it's, it's a really tricky, um, uh, it, it, it's a very challenging scenario because um, we just don't always know how sick these patients have been by the time you see them. Um, but I think anybody who's who's had CNS dysfunction, and, and by CNS dysfunction I mean, um, not just syncope, so a period, of, you know, not not just a, a vasovagal where they've collapsed and then been GCS 15 straight away, comp, uh, completely compass mentis and 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 conscious, but anybody who has been confused or had or, or had a you know more significant CNS dysfunction, I think the presumed diagnosis should be exertional heat stroke, and they should have serial blood tests. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, Todd. Um, sorry, all the questions are coming at you, but. Uh, uh, my question is a bit more about the process you mentioned. I'm a, a medic who'll be working tomorrow. And you mentioned 60 second triage, then uh, rectal temperature, rectal probe to maintain temperature. My understanding was the fact that it was portable would mean that the unit could come out to the medical tent. And therefore, I'm assuming all that starts, you know, say I'm at mile 23, starts there rather than in the ITU tents. Um, and my second question is, um, the iQuick that you showed, it's always, in the pictures, is always closed up, but my assumption is it will work almost as well for calling if you have it open to give CPR at the same time or not. Yeah. Uh, yes, good, good questions. Uh, so firstly, um, as part of your initial assessment of an acutely unwell collapsed runner, I would say you want to, essentially what we're saying in that 60 second assessment is you want to know their core temperature within 60 seconds of them presenting to you. Um, along with other, you know, uh, initial assessments, SATs, blood pressure, pulse, um, ECG monitoring, if that's available, um, and then you should you should start cooling with the capability that have that you have at the, at scene. So that might be strip fan spray, or it might be iced water, whatever you, the best thing you have available to you, and then um, calling control and asking for iQuick capability if 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 it's available to you. Um, in terms of CPR, um, our, we we have a well drilled protocol for managing a patient who deteriorates rates within the eye, eye quick um, and we would evacuate them within 60 seconds and start CPR. Um, that's very unlikely to happen. Um, there's no uh, documented cases of that happening, but we do drill and prepare for it. Um, hi, um, I'm going to spin the conversation off slightly to NSAIDs again. And given the conversation that was just going on at the start, I wonder what the panels and potentially you, Courtney, view is on Volterol being a sponsor for this year and next year at the London Marathon? 
Uh, well, as a representative of the London Marathon, I might, sta <laughs> I might start and I might tell you that uh, whilst I'm not here to defend sponsorship, uh, we've had a look at, uh, into the evidence and the evidence about uh, anti-inflammatory absorption is 18 times lower in Voltrol gel than in anti-inflammatory tablets. So we feel that that's an acceptable, uh, it's an acceptable risk. The risk is extremely small by, taking anti by using topical anti-inflammatory gel, and we don't see the same kind of medical conditions that we've mentioned before. Anything to add? Yeah, I guess in a way it's good we're having this conversation um, and, and raising awareness because, as, as Sophie said, lots of people aren't aware of the dangers of NSAIDs and, and exercise. Um, my opinion on it is I think it's a reasonable thing to use an NSAID to facilitate activity and exercise, um, submaximal activity and exercise. I wouldn't advocate using an NSAID when you're going to deliver a mac, uh, you know, close to your maximum performance and push your body to the physiological limit. So that might be in a, in a hot environment or it might be in a race environment. So th th that's my personal opinion on it. If it facilitates you staying active and mobile and, and you know, training w within the, um, the limits of, of kind of safe from a musculoskeletal perspective, then that's fine. But I don't think they are drugs that you should be touching in, in the 24 hours around a, a, a high intensity uh, performance. Thank you, everyone. I'm Lars Saini from St. Mary's University. Really interesting about the sort of research side of things. I guess this question is for, I'll give you a break, for the others. And <laughs> it was really interesting to hear where the research is currently on these topics. But when we come back next year, where would you see that this research has moved and evolved? Do you have a specific, specific person to start that question? Start the answer? Okay, well, perhaps I can start. Um, well, just from a personal perspective, having tested nearly 200 people and taken lots of tissue samples, we're actually going to be analysing them. So I think for large-scale research projects, there's always a time issue um, and data processing issue. So, you know, I, I often get called by people in the media and say, uh, you know, what's latest in ageing research? You say, well, exercise as much as you can. <laughs> Eat well. <laughs> so, is there nothing more interesting than that? Well, it's still the same kind of thing. So, I, I think sometimes we, we look for great groundbreaking leaps all the time when actually most of the research that is done is kind of in, you know, steadily incremental. Um, and I think from our perspective, what has changed since we started, for example, our uh, initial investigations on our cyclists nine years ago is the technological advances that have been. I mean, Courtney's been talking about the advances we have, for example, in MRI. But in terms of the way we can analyze tissue and the information that we can derive now. So when I first started being interested in, in sort of muscle growth factors, for example, you could measure one gene. And quantifying one gene into this thing was really exciting. But now you get 30,000 genes that you can measure in a single sample. And now you have the enormous problems of how do you handle all of that data. Um, so there are big advances in technology which allows you to do more things. Um, and you know, we've been able to probe things like the, the transcriptomic profiles, the molecular signatures. Um, and from our perspective, we're really interested in mapping that in or mapping that on to the whole body physiology. That's really the important bit because ultimately it's not really what your transcriptomic profile is telling you. It's what can you do physiologically? What is your function? And in the instance of here, it's, you know, what, what time can you run in a marathon or whatever it may be? But across the population for older people, it's... Can you stand up from the chair and you know, walk across the kitchen and make a cup of tea? So trying to marry those two things with, with the function and the sort of more detailed approaches that we can take to, to, to sample and tissue analysis and big data as a whole um, is probably where we're going, but maybe not by next year to have that information. I hope that answers the question. So my, my answer for this conference next year is AI. AI is really helping us utilize imaging better. And a lot of the questions around uh, sport and exercise really benefit from good imaging, in particular MRI, but it, it doesn't have to be. Um, there's uh, 
the cardiologists are using AI for echocardiography um, and, and other non-invasive imaging that's likely to be used in, in exercise science studies. So that's my answer, it's AI. So my answer is the same to guys, so AI uh, helps us. Also, the inspired things uh, I visited here, uh, the science field and the practical field will, is well connected. So here in Japan, uh, uh, the Japan I live, so it's a really difficult. Uh, we have a big wall, huge gap between scientific and the practical field. So how connect, how communicate with these two words is on the, yeah, the next challenging, I think. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I think I should definitely speak with Todd again because he took all of the questions I normally get. So <laughs> definitely need that. So I think a couple of things in the heat space is one, essentially a, a repository, as Todd alluded to, for these complex medically driven collapses all the really cool stuff Todd spoke about, he um, prefaced that with, this is a really cool data, but a very small sample, so coordinating that global approach would be great. And understanding the processes of how someone reaches that state with the types of cloud-based um, peripheral data collection during the races from both the elites across sexes all the way down, and we haven't even said the, the word para-athlete so far today. We have lots of other athletes we need to be aware of, so I think, utilizing the tech to get that data to understand how they get to that point when they do having much better coordinated data and i would probably say implementation science of the education to world-class athletes all the way down the practitioners and really getting the message across of what they can and can't do and if you could stop an athlete running if they'd been sick in probably the week or two weeks before I don't know how many cases Todd thinks you could probably stop, but a large percentage of them. Come on, Todd, you must have more. Uh, no, I, I've got nothing more. I think, as, as Lee's identified, um, you know, just increasing our knowledge of uh, exertional heat stroke and, and trying to develop our understanding of what risk factors, you know, are significant and, and really work on prevention. Prevention, as you know, I think is the theme of today, is better than cure. So, um, you know, we, we need to be get better at, at trying to prevent exertional heat stroke, even if it is relatively rare. You know, it would be nice that we don't have to use the eye quick at all tomorrow. Hello, just a question um, for probably orthopedic side. So the first two speakers, I'd say. I'm one of the physiotherapists. I've volunteered at the marathon the last 14 years or so. Um, and one of the questions that we ask to runners that have finished, so on the finishing tents, who have musculoskeletal you know, concerns, is how is your training? So it was more about preparation, graded exposure, and whether in your studies you ask that question, did they have good training, did they do adequate graded exposure, and did that have an effect on their joints and the navicular height? Um, I, we inadvertently studied that question in, in detail, and the, and the answer is all the people that we studied followed the London Marathon training program on the website and they didn't run into any problems and I think we uh, possibly have stumbled across confirming how good the graded training programs are now over a 16 week period taking somebody who has done less than an hour of exercise a week and turning them into a marathon runner. So it, it's, it's take it easy. And, and, and use a, that, I mean, I, I guess those training programs have developed over many years, really. I, d I don't know, I don't, I don't know the origins of the training programs, but um, we confirm that they work. Navicular height. <laughs> mm, yes. Uh, 
So actually, we didn't uh, the measure uh, the collected data about the training or something like that. So we just measured the navicular height before and after the marathon trainings. Yeah, we can do some intervention uh, before and after training, but uh, yeah, we are planning, but not yet. I'm sorry. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Abdurrahman. I'm the medical director of Riyadh Marathon, Saudi Arabia. So it's a hot climate. So I'm circling back to Todd and Liz with my comment and questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we do uh, have a Riyadh Marathon in the early, uh, earliest week of February, which is the, the coldest uh, time. It's about, when we say cold in Saudi Arabia, it's 20, 25. That's our cold weather. So we don't have the privilege to uh, Wait for, we don't have an option of acclimatizing through the summer, which is 50 degree for the athletes. Back to your point, which is nice, but for London. So, uh, Riyadh Marathon is just th three editions and fourth edition next year. From my experience, we plan, I'm going to make sh this short, uh, the medical station, especially in the second half uh, of the marathon, to add mist fan, uh, that are the big mist fan at the medical station, like after the 30 kilometer. But uh, this is something that I wanted to share in our special uh, climate like Saudi Arabia and that region. But my question in general, how organizers can effectively tailor heat acclimatization protocols for runners uh, for safety and performance? Maybe it's a big topic, but wanted to hear from you. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think the majority of people competing in the in the Riyadh Marathon, um, Mafi Muscular, no problem, no problem. But I think for anybody coming in, especially from Europe and the rest of the Northern Hemisphere where it's winter, I think the typical stuff that Todd and his teams adopt, and it's having the high quality cooling facilities, especially as some heat illnesses present irrelevant of core body temperature or the environmental temperature. So I think from the outside looking in, the misting fan wouldn't probably give you anything from an emergency capacity and probably not as effective for the runners, at least from a perceptual perspective, is pouring it. Something that's really useful, which they did in, in Doha for the Qatar stuff, was they had a looped course rather than a city course. So they essentially had a 10-unit ICU space with circulating ice-cold water and a dock for each station and the 60-second triage and all of those things. So I think... It's about getting those facilities ready, and if you can't deliver it on the course, it's getting the person there in a buggy very quickly. And keep simple things that you never thought of, keeping the press away from that area who are getting pictures that they shouldn't. So I think it's those high quality facilities at the end and training the staff, making them aware, the volunteers, and simple things, having enough wheelchairs for collapsed athletes, like a, probably a one to four ratio if it's for the elite end of the spectrum. If it's mass participation, you're not going to get one to four. But I'm sure Todd's got better things to say than me. Uh, no, not really. I agree, I, I agree with all of that. I, th I think you, um, one of the challenges is, is capacity and planning uh, for these events. So. If you looked at the weather forecast for London five days ago, it was going to be 18 degrees, and I thought we were going to be very, very busy and see a, a significant amount of exertional heat stroke. The temperatures forecast for tomorrow is now 12 degrees Celsius with a wind, wet bulb globe temperature is going to be relatively low, I would say. Um, so we, we've planned you know, for high numbers and we'll probably have excess capacity, but we're in a very fortunate position at London in that we've got lots of resource, lots of people, high profile event, lots of people want to volunteer their time. That's not possible at all events. And so I think you need to think about alternative, less resource intensive cooling options and make sure that you just have capacity to scale. Um, strip fan spray is relatively uh, low resource um, and the avian astomosis is relatively low resource. Um, so, you know, those alternatives are still very valid and something is better than nothing um, but I think if you get someone who's critically unwell and hypothermic you want to get them cool as quickly as possible and so you want to you want to have the capacity to deliver the gold standard which is ice cold water immersion 
Hi all, um, thank you for a really fascinating, informative morning. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Um, my question is for Alistair. Um, I'm a physiotherapist and also work with Charity Versus Arthritis. So I was delighted to hear him talk about not using the term wear and tear. Um, so I'd just like to know, in clinic, how do you explain osteoarthritis to your patients? Uh, well, we do, we do have the benefit of imaging, and um, it's actually pretty easy to show a patient that the cartilage is worn out, and the, it's called osteoarthritis, um, and um, it just generally it doesn't... It, I, it's just... It's fa it's, I've phased out the use of, of wear and tear as a, a phrase. Um, so I, I ask people a lot about what, what they like doing, what they used to do, what they want to get back to doing. And um, they, it, activity contributes so much to patients' lives. And, and we focus on... Uh, getting them back to it, really. It's maybe not the best answer. It's, the, the reason it's, it's, it's always going to be hard to answer is because we don't know the true cause of, of osteoarthritis, which is a really embarrassing thing to say in a world where we do know so much about the diseases we see. But... Yeah, we don't know what causes osteoarthritis. Cartilage is an extremely complicated material. I'm going to interrupt and take, take two more questions, one here and one there, and then we're going to have to finish, I'm afraid. Um, so back to Todd, just a really, really quick question for you, Todd. Um, you, when talking about um, a, a somebody, a runner that's come in and has experienced heat illness that we've treated. Um, in terms of the importance of that follow-up, a lot of people obviously will not want to bother their doctor, always busy, etc. Just in terms of a question you asked back to the lady, would you be advising anybody who had been treated for heat illness to make that appointment with a doctor to go and get a follow-up blood test, etc., or would it only be if they weren't feeling well in the next kind of 24, 48 hours? So, um, obviously, you can have mild exertional heat illness. Some people call that exertional heat exhaustion. I think if you've had a mild episode, then that doesn't need follow-up if you're feeling well. Obviously, if you start to feel unwell, then you should you see, should seek medical advice. If you've had exertional heat stroke, so either a measured or suspected core temperature above 40, um, and C CNS dysfunction, so anything from confusion to being unconscious for a period of time that wasn't rapidly resolving, then they, sh they should be followed up um, as routine. And, and in, in the absence of any symptoms, I would want those, those patients followed up because there are cases where patients have felt well for two or three days and then developed significant organ dysfunction um, and even need a transplant. Um, so it, it, it's very hard um, because it is a relatively heterogeneous condition and it presents in a range of ways. But I think if you have someone who collapses who has significant CNS dysfunction, even if they haven't had a temperature measured um, or it's, it's below 40, um, but you suspect it might have been higher, then I think we just treat that presumptively as exertional heat stroke and, and follow that up, you know, as, 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 as per that kind of protocol. Hi, hi. I'm the lead course physio tomorrow for the London Math, and we've got a team of about uh, over 100 physios and students that will man medical stations between 50, uh, mile 15 and mile 24, um, plus another team on the finish. Um, my question is, one of the most common things we see is, uh, is cramp. Um, what's the best way for us to actually manage that, please? And this is a, a, a group question. So how, how should we be dealing with, pay, uh, with, with runners that come in with cramp? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. It's from a, for a sports scientist and physiologist. So there's two types of cramp. Most of the ones you'll get tomorrow are probably related to exertional pathways rather than electrolyte depletion. 
If you're, so in cricket, for example, we get a lot of players that have cramping hands when they bat due to high sweat rates. So we can offset that quite well with electrolyte supplementation in the days leading up to the race. So if anyone's had a cramp before, there's no adverse, um, there's no reason why you wouldn't give them electrolyte supplementations for two to three days up to the event. In terms of if they present with it, it's the classical physio type stuff that, stuff that you can do. And if they can shake it and get them moving quickly, it's generally a good sign. If you can't, it's pretty, it's pretty tricky. And probably anything you give them orally is not gonna have an effect if it's electrolyte driven. So um, if it's fatigue, it's fatigue and there's not really too much you can do about it. Physios generally know what, what should be done. There's no magic bullet for it, unfortunately. Better training next time. <laughs> okay, so, so it does pain me to do so, but I do have to bring this to a close. I, I hope you've all been enjoying I've certainly been enjoying listening to, to all of you. I'd like to say a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, to our speakers, who have given their time, their effort, their expertise, their enthusiasm, and to, to bring together some really enlightening, entertaining, and uh, I suggest also eye-opening talks, and I hope you've all learnt as much as I have. Uh, I'd like to thank the organisers, uh, Kelly's outside, who's helped to organise this, but also to uh, Dr. Amy Boltz and Dr. Ch Professor Charlie Pedler, who uh, together we've organised this conference, and I'd like to thank you for your help, and to the London Marathon for continuing to host this conference for the 40th time. Uh, but thank you to all of you. Thank you to our audience, because without you we wouldn't be here. Thank you so much for coming along and bringing your questions, bringing your interests, and bringing your own expertise to the, to the environment. Uh, and it's, it's really for you that we do this, so I genuinely appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, I want to say a quick note about one of our audience who sadly isn't here today. Sue Crew-Smith has been a member of the audience for the last 43 years. Not just at the Marathon Medicine Conference, but she was also a physiotherapist at the London Marathon since the very beginning. And sadly, Sue passed away last year. And as a staunch supporter of this, kind of com this conference in particular, and looking after marathon participants, for which she received a member of the Order of the British Empire. I think it's appropriate that we take just a brief thought to reflect and, and remember her. And uh, her daughter, Ali, has already told you how much, she, how closely she's been involved in the marathon as a result. I, I would, I'm going to move on and I'm going to change subjects very simply. I'd like to ask you please to fill in your feedback. Those of you who've been here several years in a row, you will know that we listen to your feedback and we take great, great stock of what you tell us. And what we'd like to know is, who would you like us to invite next time? How can we do things better? QR codes are on the back. Do fill in those, do fill in those forms. Those of you who are clinicians, and this is particularly relevant for doctors, the Faculty of Sport and Exercise Medicine has accredited this for CPD. And for you to, your certificate on the inside, for doctors, please would you sign your name on the register outside. Of course we've taken your check-in, but please sign your name on the register, which is there as documentary evidence of you having attended. So it's on the tables on, on the outside. I'm going to close by saying for those of you who are running tomorrow, do enjoy yourselves, do look after yourselves. For those of you who are working at the event, I hope it goes well. I hope the two groups don't meet. <laughs> if they do, you can at least be assured that you, if you're a runner, will be in the best possible hands receiving the most up-to-date medical care. Uh, so thank you very much for, enjoy for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next year. Good luck tomorrow. <laughs>